Good morning, Redeemer. So good to be with you all this morning. Come on, let's stand together. Psalm 92 says, It is good to give thanks to the Lord and to sing to your name, O Most High. We believe that this morning. It's good for us to be together. It's good for us to sing to the Lord, to worship Him this morning. Let's lift Him high. Come on. Your goodness, I would be desperate without your love. Slave to the darkness, if it wasn't for the cross, you'd have won me with your kindness, chase me down.
church feel free to grab a seat welcome to redeemer my name is corey i'm one of your pastors one staff here and we're super glad to worship with you here this morning now i have a few announcements for us that are very important this morning but before we get to those as we do every single week uh, we do this thing called a register okay now why do we do this thing called a register first of all to let us know that you are here with us today that's very important for us so please let us uh, know that you are here worshiping with us but then also um, for us to know how we can be praying for you we as a church staff, I promise, and I, and I don't promise a lot, but we pray for you guys every single week. And we want to know how we can be praying for you. So please let us know in that register how we can be praying for you. But then also, uh, this is where you can sign up for all things Redeemer. So if it's a small group, if you want to be a part of a serve team, which we need you in, by the way. Thank you. Um, 
a serve team, or if it's anything that I'm going to announce today, all these things you can sign up for within our register. So uh, let's dive into our announcements here quickly. And the first one is something that we celebrate here often, and that is baptism. There we go. Good job. Well done. Well done, church. So on November the 15th, we will be having a baptism service. And this is a time where we go and we publicly proclaim what Jesus has done in our life. Uh, and we celebrate those things. And so if you desire to do that with us, um, you can swing by our next steps table located in the lobby or fill it out in our register. Uh, and someone will get in contact with you with all the details here very soon. November the 15th, so please do that for us. Let us know if you want to be baptized. And then also, uh, on November the 15th, we are having this thing called parent commissioning. Now, back in the day, uh, we would call this baby dedication. Uh, but we decided to switch it to parent commissioning because we see the role of our parents as so important. Um, as a guy who has been in student ministry for six plus years now, one, I am feeling very old, uh, but, but two, I see the importance of parents discipling their kids. And the reason why we do parent commissioning um, is because we want to come alongside of you. We want to encourage you. Uh, we want to hold you accountable. And, hey, I'm going to lead the way in discipling my kids as a primary discipler of the wonderful gift that God has given me. So if you desire to be a part of this, uh, we would love to celebrate you on that. But if you want to be a part of this, again, swing by our next steps table um, or let us know in the register. Uh, and then, again, someone will get in contact with you very shortly. Now, the last one, um, again, is for my parents in the room of babies through 10 years of age. The main thing I want for you to hear me say is this. On October 25th, we plan to get back to a full-time kids ministry, okay? Uh, we plan to have kids minute. That, come on now. Amen. Amen. No more kids in the service. Get out. We love you. But go to kids ministry, right? Um, so we will have that first and second service. And the goal again is October 25th for that to happen. Now, um, in wisdom, uh, we are watching uh, the data in regards to COVID cases. Uh, and we understand that there's some movement there. Uh, so, that, so that may impact October 25th. But as of right now, October 25th, it's going down, kids' ministry. Uh, but if anything changes, uh, just know where you can find any changes at. That is in your email. We, we will be very prompt and very clear with you if anything changes. But you can find those changes in your email or you can find them on our social media. Okay, so just be on the lookout in case anything changes. Now, as we uh, dive back into worship, uh, we're going to go into a time, again, of song and worshiping the Lord through giving. And I say this every single time that I am up here. I am so thankful for a very, very generous church. You guys allow for us uh, to do the mission in which God has called us to and glorify him by making disciples. Uh, and so, man, again, such a generous church. You guys kill it in this, in a good way, kill it. And so if you do desire to give um, to our church, you can give um, either in the offering boxes on your way out the door. You can go onto our app. You can go onto our website and give there. Or if you're old school, you can mail a check into the offices. Whatever floats your boat, we appreciate it. And so, um, yes, let's continue to give so that we can see the Lord furthered in our community. Now, I want to pray for us. Let's get back to worship um, and get ready for a time of his word as well. So let's pray. Father. Lord, just thank you for today. God, I thank you that we can gather, Lord, and worship your name. Lord, I just pray uh, for us this morning. God, I know a lot of us come into this room with a lot of burdens on our minds, on our hearts, a lot of baggage coming in from the week. Um, Lord, and I just pray that you would just consume our minds so much to where we just forget about those things. Lord, I pray that the only thing that we would focus on right now would be you. God, I pray that we would just um, leave the sin that plagued us this week behind. Lord, that we would leave, um, Lord, all of the battles this week behind, the financial troubles, whatever it may be, the struggles, um, the battle with family members. Lord, may you just take us over in this moment. Just let us enjoy you. And Lord, just let us leave encouraged and just filled up with you. So God, may you be glorified this morning. Lord, we love you and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. Because 
of Jesus. All is promised. One for me. When he paid the highest ransom. Once for always. For my freedom. And I will boast in Christ alone. His righteousness. And not my own. And I will cling to Christ. Desperation, 
I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such bound? Thank you for hope. 
God, in a world where we, we look around and, and there is a lot of hopelessness, we know and we are confident in the hope we have in the name and in the glory and in the work and in the person of Jesus. We praise you this morning because we have hope. God, would you root us? Would you ground us in that hope? Would you help us remember how sweet and awesome and good that hope is, the hope of Jesus? So we just give you glory this morning. God, I pray. Uh, I know we, we walk through these doors and there can be a lot of distractions, a lot of things on our minds and, and weighing on our hearts. I just pray, Holy Spirit, would you cut through the distraction this morning and, and would we just be ready to receive from you, from your word? We know that uh, when we're gathered in this room, you're working, you're moving, you're speaking to us, and just help us receive that. Uh, through your word, by your Holy Spirit, God, we want to hear from you this morning. And so just give us ears to hear, give us eyes to see, and help us be receptive to the word you have for us this morning. So glorify yourself in this time we pray. In Jesus' awesome name, amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Y'all can uh, pull out your Bibles, open to uh, Genesis chapter 6. So a couple of weeks ago, I was driving home from uh, work from at the uh, church office, and I head west on Smith Valley Road. You know, once you get through the circle, you got to get right. So I got right, and the car in front of me wasn't driving, you know, quite as fast as I had hoped it would be driving. And so I was like, all right, well, there's a big space. I'm going to, you know, move to the left and then get right, and I whatever reason the car chose at that moment to decide to go the speed limit. And so there's no more space, which means I'm stuck in the left-hand lane as I'm coming up to the middle school, which all of you from around here know means I'm about to turn left when I don't want to turn left. I want to go straight. And I'm like, well, here I am. I don't really have any other choice. So I turn left, and immediately my wife texts me and says, hey, would you uh, grab something from Aldi for the family? Which means now I have to go like around and back up north, and I'm like, oh, this is not where I want to be. Y'all ever made that choice? Make a choice and you're like, oh, this is not where I want to be. How did I get here? Uh, see it in the, uh, the classic fable, Finding Nemo. Uh, Nemo recognizes his dad is, you know, kind of overbearing. He wants to uh, escape the reef and have an adventure. And so he comes to the edge of the reef. And he's like, I'm going to do it. And his friend's like, no, don't do it. I'm going to do it. No, don't do it. And he decides, I'm going to do it. And he goes out, and he uh, smacks the boat, and in a terrifying moment, gets captured. So Nemo wants to have an adventure, but he ends up in a plastic bag. How did he get there? This happens in life. I made a choice. I wanted a thing. I took a step, and I ended up here. But I thought I'd be over here. We end up asking ourselves, how did we get here? We're going to open up to Genesis chapter 6, and as we dive in, there are a lot of how did we get here moments. We're only nine generations removed from the Garden of Eden. From everything was awesome to everything's not awesome. Everything is different. And we're going to see just how bad it got. But even in that darkest moment, we're going to see a glimmer of hope. So a uh, little context. Uh, you remember uh, Genesis 1 and 2 is the seven days of creation. In Genesis 2, we get to see more about how God created man. Genesis 3, uh, Adam and Eve eat the fruit. Sin enters the world. But even there, we see that little glimmer of hope. That little promise that God makes in Genesis 3.15. You will crush his heel. He will crush your head. And then Genesis chapter 4, we see from the fruit to murder. And then Genesis 5, we see this uh, genealogies play out. And so we begin at Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Now 900 years after the birth of Seth in Genesis chapter 4. And Genesis 6 is going to tell us the story of the world's path to destruction. And how God kept his promise through one man's faith. Let's pray. Lord, we believe that your word is inspired. That your word is authoritative. That, that we have your words here in front of us. 
So Lord, help us to understand it. Just shine a light and illuminate your scripture to us this morning. And Lord, help us to walk away understanding what this means for how we ought to have faith, believe, act, follow you today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so here we go. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1. Get your eyes right down on it. When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the Son of God came into the daughters of man, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. All right, y'all got that? Perfectly clear? <laughs> Listen, there are some passages that are tough to understand that use words that I've never used before. I'm just going to say Nephilim is not a word I commonly use. And so... It's important to recognize that we believe God's word is inerrant, that it is inspired, that it is authoritative, and that it is meant to be understood. And so sometimes when we come along a passage and we're like, what does that mean? I'm so confused. It's appropriate to slow down, wrestle through it, study it carefully, and move through the passage very carefully. So we're going to do that right now. So let's just look back over this. We're going to go through it carefully. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. This is very good. Genesis 1.28, God gave Adam and Eve in the command to be fruitful and multiply. And we're seeing it right here. Be fruitful and multiply. When man began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them. Good. Now, the sons of God saw that the daughters of man were attractive, and they took as their wives any as they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days. And also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the children, uh, came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them, these were the mighty men who were of old, the men of Rian. Now this brings out some questions, right? Who were the sons of God? Who were the daughters of men? What in the world is the Nephilim, and why should I care at all? So based on some study... And I would say this is a passage that when I was in Bible college, we sat around the table and go, like, what do you think? Well, you're wrong because, and well, you're wrong because. And this is a, top, a, a passage that's debated a lot. And sometimes when we debate what the, uh, well, who is that and who is that and who is that, we miss what God is really trying to reveal to us. But based on the study and uh, sort of the classical interpretation of this, I believe that uh, the sons of God were the godly descendants of Seth. If you remember in Genesis chapter 4, the very end of it last week, Pastor Brock said, and the people began to call upon the name of the Lord because God gave Seth to Eve. And then as you studied Genesis 5 this week, hopefully you saw the descendants kind of falling out and being enumerated after that until we end up in this place. So the sons of God are the godly descendants of Seth. I think it makes the most sense in context. And then the daughters of man then are the ungodly descendants of Cain. We saw that he was ex, uh, expended. He was uh, uh, sent out. He's not allowed to settle. He is now a wanderer, an ungodly. And you see the descendants of Cain ending up in this place. So the godly culture and the ungodly culture now coming together and having children who are ungodly. And then the Nephilim in this passage is, again, a, a, a something that's uh, hotly debated. But what we see is that these two groups of people uh, came together and made children. And the Nephilim, it's like God is trying to say these men thought they were something special. These were giants. These were uh, mighty men. They were important. They were well-known. They had great authority, maybe they were great warriors, and there's a little bit of hubris in this. There's a little bit of, wow, look at us, we're special. And God looks at them and says in verse 3, my spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be 120 years. God's got something for those men, 
and he's just started the countdown clock. Click. In 120 years, we're just going to see how important they are. See, God's word is full of him using natural and supernatural means to humble those who think they're special. Little g gods don't fare very well against the all-powerful God of the Bible. So we have these who were godly marrying those who weren't godly because they looked good and having babies who think they're special. And that brings us to verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Is there a stronger way that you can think of to say that man was rotten to the core? Every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Just utterly wicked. I think it's fascinating that that word continually, as it's translated in the ESV, is all of the days. Like all of them. All days. And so we see this contrast beginning, and I just want to show it to you uh, up here. In Genesis 131, uh, the same word is used, yom, for day. And in Genesis, after the creation, God looks at it and says, days one through seven, looks at it and says, man, this is very good. And just a few chapters later, God looks at it and says, all the days, man, this is only evil. We've reached the point where the wickedness of man is as certain as the sunrise. How did we get here? We got here because, number one, sinful compromise leads to increasing wickedness. At the end of chapter 4, we have hope. And then the, at that time, there began to be people who called on the name of the Lord to all wicked, all the time. The compromise of godly people marrying ungodly people created ungodly people. And slowly but surely, as the people began to multiply over the face of the earth, they didn't multiply and be fruitful for the glory of God. They multiplied and became fruitful in their own wickedness. Sinful compromise leads to increasing wickedness. I'm not the most savvy financial mind. But do you all understand the uh, beauty that is compound interest? Compound interest is amazing. Uh, so the idea of compound interest is that you get interest on your interest on your interest. You make an investment, and after a certain period, a year, or whatever, you get interest on that. And then the next year, you don't just get interest on the original investment. You get interest on the investment plus the interest. And then the next year, you get, invest you get interest on the investment plus the interest plus the interest plus the interest. And so what ends up happening is your little investment starts to go like this. And it becomes exponential. And so your one investment over many years or many generations becomes massive. And that is exactly what we see here. We see exponential wickedness. From eating of the fruit, sin enters the world, to murder, to now all evil all the time. What started is simple compromise. What started as murder. What started as the godly marrying the ungodly and becoming ungodly created exponential evil all over the face of the earth. What we see as the result of the knowledge of good and evil is that evil becomes dominant. Sinful compromise leads to increasing wickedness, and the same pattern happens in your life. Emily Dixonson wrote a poem that I think illustrates it perfectly. She says this, crumbling is not an instant act. Imagine a glacier, and you see all, the, all of a sudden a glacier just cracks and half of it falls into the ocean. You're like, wow, that happened all in an instant. Not so. Crumbling is not an instant act, a fundamental pause. Dilapidations processes are organized decays. 
his first a cobweb on the soul. Look at that. The soul unattended to. First just a cobweb. A cuticle of dust. A borer in the access. The little insect is just termiting away. An elemental rust. Ruin is formal devil's work, consecutive and slow. Fail in an instant, no man good. Slipping is Crash's law. See, what she's saying is massive failure doesn't occur in an instant. Massive failure is a result of seasons of compromise. One decision after another leading to an explosion. Moral failure is the result of all of those ignored decisions. So as we look at this passage, we see that sin is taking us further than we want to go, leaving us wondering, how did we get here? And so the question that we have to ask ourselves in light of Genesis 6, 1 through 5 is, where have you begun to compromise? What are the intentions of the thoughts of your heart? When you see somebody who has made a decision and has exploded their life, it's easy to look at that and say, I would never do that. But that wasn't step one. That was step 176. And we are arrogant fools if we believe that we're on step zero of that process. So where have you begun to compromise? What are the intentions of your heart? How did we get here? Sinful compromise leads to increasing wickedness. So now what? Where does God go from here? Number two, wickedness leads to deserved judgment. Verse 6, and the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth. It grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and animals and creeping things, birds of the heavens, for I am sorry that I have made them. This is heavy. When I was studying this, it's like that's a moment where you have to put your pen down and just go, ugh. From very good to grieved his heart in five chapters. Have you ever looked in the face of somebody who's grieving? Tear streaks on their face. The smile contorted into anguish. Now imagine that you caused that. Our sin grieves God deeply. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continuously. The Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. Now, when we first read this, that God regretted making man, it can seem like God is changing his mind. That our sin has caused God to change direction. Frankly, that's a very small view of God. It's a misunderstanding of who God is. And we believe that you have to use Scripture to interpret Scripture. So if we come upon something like this that makes me think a certain thing or feel a certain way that God reject, regretted and maybe He changed His plan because of that, then we have to use other Scripture to understand what this passage means. And in uh, Psalm 102, 27, in Malachi 3.16, James 1.17, 1 
Hebrews 1.12, all of those say that God doesn't change. God has never changed His mind. God is who He is, and He is who He always will be. Theologically, we say that God is immutable. God does not change. So what does it mean that He regrets? The regret is similar to when I have to discipline my children or when you have to discipline your children. There's no joy in that. I hate it. I don't want to do it. But I know that it's for their good. I know that it's what is right. And in that moment when I discipline, I don't regret in the way that I wish I had not done it. I regret in the way that I wish it didn't have to be this way. I regret that this is what it's come to. It's not that I've changed my mind. It's not that God has changed his mind. It's that it has filled him with sadness and disappointment and grief. God doesn't change his mind. He's sad and disappointed and grieved deeply by the rampant wickedness on the earth. And that wickedness leads to deserved judgment. That's why God says He's going to blot them from the face of the earth. His path and His plan is to exact judgment for the wickedness. And for our wickedness. Because when you break the righteous law of God, you stand condemned and the penalty is severe. And so in this moment, when God looks and he sees nothing but evil, he brings judgment because he's righteous. And in that moment, in our feelings, we can be like, oh, that that feels vindictive. It feels mean. But God is not mean. It says in Isaiah 59, 2, that our iniquities, our sin has created separation from God. Those of you that know me know that I'm still a little bit of a child at heart. Uh, that's the reason I used Finding Nemo as an illustration. <laughs> I, uh, I, sometimes I wake up in the morning and I, I'll make eggs, and there's a couple of people in my family that like eggs the way I like eggs, and so I have a little pan that's very specifically used for those uh, eggs. That, uh, and afterwards, I always want to take the hot pan and, and, and turn on the cold water, stick it in there. What happens? My wife is like, don't do that. You'll ruin the pan. I'm like, I don't care. I want to see it. Now, maybe uh, when you were a kid, uh, you know, your mom or your grandma was making pancakes, and so you get the griddle, right, and you put your hand in the water and go like this. What happens? See, what's happening there is that the hot pan and the cold water can't be together. By nature, something is happening there. The cold water interacting with the hot pan goes, our sin interacting with a holy God goes, we by nature can't be near a holy God because of our sinfulness. It's a nature thing. So God makes separation. God brings righteous and deserved judgment. God no more hates us than the pan hates the water. In fact, it says that God loves us so much that He sent His only Son to die for us. That whoever believes in Him won't die, but will have eternal life. We don't have to pay the penalty ourselves because Jesus Christ paid the penalty. And all we have to do is believe in Him. All we have to do is have faith, which brings us mercifully and gracefully to verse 8. In the midst of rampant wickedness. Verse 8. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. That is really good news. God has just said the entire earth is all evil and I'm going to judge it. But Noah found favor in the eyes 
of the Lord. We're going to throw it up here. I want you to keep your eyes in Genesis chapter 6, but this is what the writer of Hebrews had to say about Noah. By faith, Noah, being warned concerning events as yet unseen. He didn't know what's coming. God gave him a warning. And by faith, and in reverent fear, he constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. After so much evil, sinful compromise is leading to increasing wickedness. That wickedness is leading to deserved judgment. There's a glimmer of hope. Number three, judgment is abated by grace through faith. That is good news. The word abated means to become null or void, to be lessened, to become toothless, like a saw that has no bite. That judgment is abated by grace through faith. But Noah. Verse 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God. I love this. Noah walked with God. Walking with God is a word picture used all throughout Scripture of this daily progressive journey of faith. Noah walked with God. Abraham walked with God. Paul says, walk like this, not as unwise, but as wise. Walk in love. First Peter talks about walking with God. That's why we use walk with Christ as one of the foundational disciple-making mechanisms in our church. It's essential for Noah. It's essential for us. Verse 10, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, which, if you're ever looking for like an under-the-radar biblical name, you know, like, there's a lot of Micahs, there's a lot of Noahs, there's a ton of Joshuas and Davids. I'm going to just commend to you Shem. No one else in class is going to have that name. And yet, what God does through Shem is a beautiful thing. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham and Japheth, now the earth was corrupt. It's broken and altered toward the evil in God's sight. And the earth was filled with violence. And God saw the earth, and behold, it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, I have determined to make an end of all flesh, for the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make here, Now here comes the obedience. Here comes the task. Make for yourself an ark of gopher wood. Make rooms in the ark and cover it inside and out with pitch. This is how you are to make it. The length of the ark, 300 cubits. It's about 440 feet. Its breadth, 50 cubits. 72 feet. And its height, 30 cubits. It's about 43 feet. This big boat. Make a roof for the ark and finish it to a cubit above. And set the doors of the ark in its side. Make it with lower and second and third decks. For behold, I will bring a flood of waters on the earth to destroy all flesh, in which is the breath of life under heaven. From breathing life into Adam to extinguishing the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth will die. But I will establish my covenant with you. Which, just pausing for a moment, that is a major thing. And as we continue on in the Genesis narrative, uh, Pastor Brock is going to kind of unpack that in the weeks to come. But it is a beautiful and major thing that, that God is saying right here. And then we see where it comes later. And you shall come into the ark, you, your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives, eight. And of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female of the birds according to their kinds and of the animals according to their kinds and of every creeping thing of the ground according to its kind. Don't you wish that, that maybe God had left those out? I'll take the birds and the animals, but leave the creeping things behind. According to its kind, two of every short sort shall come into you to keep them alive. Also, take with you every sort of food that is eaten and store it up. It shall serve as food for you and for them. Verse 22, Noah did this. He did all that God commanded him. 
Can you imagine this for a moment? Noah's going to be spared. God has found a way, and it was his planned way. From the very beginning, Genesis 3.15, God has made a promise, and he's going to keep that promise, and now we see how he's judging the world for their rampant evil, and yet he keeps this promise going. There's only eight righteous people left on the face of the earth. Wickedness and evil, violence is everywhere, nowhere is as safe. Evil is as certain as the sunrise. And God says, build a really big boat. So by faith, you get to building it, and man, it's going to take years and years and years. Most estimates say it took between 40 and 80 years to build this boat. I don't really know what the people around Noah did during that 40 and 80 years, but we understand their character. It's not so good. It's not like they were like, hey, Noah, man, hope that works out for you. I mean, how many times did they steal his hammer? Did he have to, like, protect the, the wood? and Did they set fire to it? We don't know, but it's all evil, all violence, all the time. And there are eight of them. And by faith, Noah completed the task. Noah did all that God commanded him. There are more godly people on my block than there were in the entire world. So what's my excuse? We live in a wicked And so, I want to show you from this passage three ways that we live by faith in a wicked culture. We live in a culture that does not follow Jesus Christ. That has not chosen Jesus Christ as the object of their worship. We are not a Christian nation. I was talking about this with uh, Kevin, our uh, director of Redeemer Kids, and one of the things he said was, Our kids are growing up in Babylon, not Jerusalem. And we'd be wise to recognize that. So the lessons of Noah, of walking by faith in a wicked culture, are exceptionally critical for us. So the first way we walk by faith in a wicked culture is that we know God. You cannot walk by faith in a culture like ours if you do not know who God is. And if you are not known by God. And the way we are known by God, the way we know God is through Jesus Christ. Through His Word. Revealed to us. And this isn't like, oh yeah, I know who God is. I've heard of Him. I kind of believe He exists. And I come to church. And so, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I'm good. I understand. I believe in God. Even the demons know that Jesus Christ is God. But they have not submitted to Him. In order to know God and be known by God, you have to submit to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Otherwise, we'll be like a ship tossed on an angry ocean. That's what it feels like in our world today. So we know God and we are known by God. And then number two, we walk with God. Noah walked with God. And we walk with God by abiding in Christ. Some great homework for you would be to read John 15 through 17 about abiding in Christ. We walk with God. That means that we take daily steps with the Lord. We listen to Him through careful study of the Word. We submit to Him and we talk to Him through prayer. We live out our faith and we serve one another in community. There were eight of them, and there are hundreds of us. And then number three, we obey God. And Noah did all that God commanded him. See, walking with God and obeying God go hand in hand. You can't say, I'm walking with God, and then be like, I'm going to live my life however I want. Those two things don't go together. So in order to 
live by faith in a wicked culture. We must obey God. That means that I don't get my worldview from CNN. That means that I don't get my marching orders on how I should behave from Fox News. It means that I get my worldview, I get my understanding of the world around me, I get who I should follow and what I should do from the revealed Word of God and following His incarnate Son, Jesus Christ. That's who we follow. We don't allow ourselves to be discipled by the the sources of this world. We allow ourselves to be discipled by mature people who follow Christ. We obey God even when it seems insane to the wicked world around us. Noah walked with God. Noah obeyed God. And there's this beautiful thread that's being pulled. See, in Genesis 3.15, God makes this promise, and I will put enmity, that's chaos, strife, make enemies between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so, as you see this whole thing play out, what you see is you see Satan trying to cut off the offspring. He knows that there is one who is to come who will solve all these problems. And he says, if I can just get that not to happen, then I'll win. And in Genesis 6, for a moment, it looks like he might. The entire world is filled with nothing but evil. Except God chose to keep his promise through Noah. He said, Noah, build a boat. And when I judge the world for their wickedness, I'll carry you through it. God made a path through one man's faith. And so we go from Noah, and in 11 generations, we get to Abraham. And then in 13 more, we get to David. And in 42 from that, we get to see the person who is Jesus Christ. That thread that started in Genesis gets pulled to Noah and gets carried on to the person of Jesus Christ because God delivers on his promise. As we consider our world today, God has promised that judgment is coming. And the only way to be carried through the judgment is through Jesus Christ. It's in Jesus Christ that we're carried through those waves and shown the grace and mercy that God has for us. Let's pray. God, we know that we are broken and sinful. And if we're honest, God, what you say about them is true of us. There's nothing in me that is different what you said about the people in Genesis 6. But Lord, because of your son, Jesus Christ, we have hope. We see it here and we feel it now. If we are in Christ, Lord, you have done so much. You have given us new life by your grace and your mercy through faith. Lord, we submit ourselves to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as we close this morning, we want to declare together we've decided to follow Jesus. The cross before me, the world behind me, we won't turn back from Jesus. Our hope is in him. And so stand with us. Let's declare this together. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back.
Amen. Jesus is enough for us. We leave clinging to him this morning. Redeemer, you are loved and you are sent. Have a great week.